Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Matt Corda. Um, I'm a senior research fellow uh, with the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. For folks who don't know us, we are an NGO based here in Washington, D.C., uh, dedicated to ensuring that science is conducted for uh, the benefit of humanity. And we have a 75 plus year legacy of doing particularly focused research on nuclear weapons and global nuclear risks. And we are here today to discuss a new program that we are very, very proud to present to you all today. To empower new voices to, to start their careers in the nuclear weapons field, this past year, uh, FAS launched um, what we are calling the New Voices on Nuclear Weapons Fellowship. So this is something that we started this past year in the summer of 2023 with uh, generous support from the MacArthur Foundation. And the fellowship was specifically created to, to address the high barriers that exist to enter into the nuclear field by providing uh, young nuclear scholars with financial support, mentorship, and opportunities for publication. So, you know, we, we had a, an inclusive application and selection process that engaged with communities outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, we highlighted candidates' uh, lived experiences, skills, interests, and, and willingness to learn. And the fellowship, you know, what, what we did was we offered well-compensated opportunities for professional development and publication, and is, is really designed to provide continued support for the fellows after they complete the program. And, you know, the, the program itself lasted for four months, but the fellows, you know, have, have been strongly engaged with us following that period, and we're excited to continue to help support their research as they sort of continue their journeys into the nuclear field. And so you'll get a chance to meet all of these fellows today and they're going to get to present their research. Um, and something that I think is, is really striking and something that I think we're really proud of in particular about this program is that we, we uh, encourage the fellows to publish their research using whatever medium they felt would communicate their message most effectively. So some chose to write series of op-eds, right? Other chose to exhibit their research through poetry or a multimedia project. Um, and so by sort of providing these, these different types of expertise and different types of uh, mentorship and opportunities for publication, um, we're really proud that we've been able to support uh, you know, this, this sort of new generation of fellows and we hope to be able to do that in the future as well. And so what you'll see today throughout these uh, the research projects that our fellows are gonna present are um, really a, a series of projects aimed at sort of rethinking traditional theories of nuclear deterrence, right? Nuclear deterrence theory is something that, you know, has, has sort of dominated the field for, for many decades, but is really undergoing this kind of academic reevaluation right now. And we are really excited to see that our four fellows have done a really fantastic and groundbreaking research that uh, is going to really sort of reshape the the deterrence theory field for for several uh, several years and decades to come. So we're extremely proud of them, and uh, we're really delighted to be able to share their work with you today. So just for a little bit of housekeeping, um, each fellow is going to have five minutes to present their research, and then we're going to turn to uh, our FAS. CEO Dan Correa to offer some framing remarks about the sort of critical moment that we are in as a field and sort of where we're heading, where we've where we've been and sort of uh, the role that this fellowship and sort of the research that the fellows are doing kind of hopes to play in the in the years to come. And then we'll turn to a Q&A and we will wrap everything up by uh, one o'clock. So um, thank you all so much. And I think without further ado, let's get started with a presentation from our first fellow, Cameron Vega. Thank you so much. My name is Cameron Vega. I'm a current Thomas Pickering Fellow uh, with the State Department, so that's where I am right now, taking a little bit of time off. Uh, I have degrees from Arizona State University in political science and political philosophy. I'm currently working on my master's in international relations at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and I've really focused on nuclear ethics as a form of framing issue for nuclear issues. I do need to stress today that all views are my own and do not represent those of the Department of State. So my project originally was the climatic effects of nuclear weapons. Uh, I focused on climate science, nuclear ethics, and the broad framing issue of rethinking deterrence. My research partner was Dr. Alan Robach, who was invaluable with my help on climate science. And I really shaped everything around nuclear ethics, which are the moral guidelines that inform how nuclear weapons may be used and for what reasons. Whether or not a state chooses to abide by nuclear ethics uh, is a critical policymaking issue, but the ethics themselves are important to kind of hammer out and figure out because they are not set in stone yet. So I have three pieces that I am sort of working on, one of which is published, and they all follow different themes. Uh, the first is the climate blind spot nuclear weapons policy. Uh, as you can see, that was published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I'm very excited about that. Second are the ethics and implications of achieving abolition. 
And third is the persisting importance of nuclear ethics. Uh, with nuclear ethics as, a, again, a framing issue, I sought to criticize both deterrence uh, from an ethical perspective, abolition from an ethical perspective, and then bring together how ethics is an important uh, factor in each of these conversations. So to start, I really based this research uh, with Dr. Alan Robach on the Lilicia XL simulation of nuclear war. Uh, they published a report that took the issue of nuclear winter very seriously. Uh, in a simulated war between the United States and Russia, uh, they estimated that there would be up to 5 billion deaths from famine alone, not including deaths from the actual war itself, uh, but just from the amount of debris that is shot up into the atmosphere by nuclear explosions. Based on this, I had four implications for nuclear deterrence. The first is that excluding climate science is counterintuitive. We'll often hear the argument that climate science or nuclear winter weakens deterrence because it makes it untenable. Uh, if our adversaries believe we have ethical reservations in using nuclear weapons, then they can take advantage of that. However, it's counterintuitive to ignore actual and real effects of nuclear weapons for the sake of maintaining security. Second, there's a soft cap on high-yield nuclear warheads. As you can see with some of the right uh, charts, I think on your guys' uh, left, you hit a point where you do so much damage to the caloric uh, production in the world. So that's crops, that's fisheries, um, that's the amount of calories that are being produced that, again, 5 billion deaths from famine is very hard to beat, um, especially in a nuclear war. So at a certain point, it doesn't matter how many warheads you deploy and use, uh, you're going to create apocalyptic levels of damage. Third, retaliatory self-defense is a just but limited cause. Self-defense is considered one of the most just causes there is in terms of retaliating against an opponent. If someone comes at you in an alley, you have a right to come back at them. But if you consider the amount of famine that would occur and the number of deaths that would happen due to a retaliatory strike, then you're actually limited in your ability to respond. A unilateral strike could cause famine on its own. But retaliating, potentially doubling the amount of debris in the atmosphere, will cause massive death. And fourth is that the doctrine of double effect is incomplete. Doctrine of double effect states that you can uh, engage in an action that has a just intentional effect and an unjust unintentional effect, and that they can nullify or be positively just depending on what action you take. However, if the US policy is that we do not target civilians, that is not at all uh, our intention, and yet the amount of debris we produce will inevitably kill civilians, then the doctrine of double effect around nuclear weapons is incomplete. You can't say you don't target civilians if you know plenty are going to die. The possibility of nuclear winter makes turns untenable, then the posture needs to change. And this leads me into my next slide on nuclear abolition. Here I present an issue called the just war dilemma of nuclear abolition with a secondary piece uh, is force necessary to achieve nuclear abolition. As you can see, I uh, put up graph from the Federation of American Scientists on nuclear stockpiles. Uh, here I define nuclear abolition as a pacifist movement that views the existence of nuclear weapons as an existential threat. It asserts that any nuclear weapon in the world is an existential threat to humanity, will cause an arms race, will cause a spiral, deterrence is unreliable due to the fact that it involves a lot of luck and chance. And thus abolition, getting rid of nuclear weapons, is the only ethical nuclear strategy. It leaves nothing to chance. There, there are no, uh, no nuclear weapons out there. However, there's no clear path to achieving abolition uh, when a state like North Korea or China or Russia refuses to disarm, uh, and even a state uh, like the United States, a uh, democratic liberal country, also refuses to disarm, there's no real way of ensuring that a state gets rid of their arms, even through international means. So I see two ways of addressing this sort of dilemma. The first is you tolerate nuclear weapons, and the state's unwilling to disarm or declare. This is the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons approach. Even though chemical weapons are out there in the world, we've destroyed all the declared stockpiles. You destroy where you have access. And so we have, in effect, rid the world of a sort of chemical weapons. But Syria still has chemical weapon stockpiles. We believe Russia does as well. And yet the OPCW is not calling on states to go in and invade. They, in effect, tolerate the weapons. It's a tense word to use, but so long as they exist and you're not effectively doing anything about it, you are de facto tolerating these weapons. The second are just wars for disarmament. This is the Iraq approach, or what Iraq was declared to be. That is that if all the nuclear weapons in the world were gone and North Korea held on to theirs, the question you have to ask abolitionists, which is a pacifist movement, is would you be willing to go to war to get rid of those weapons, or would you de facto tolerate them? Uh, and either of these approaches compromises the principles behind nuclear abolition. You either give up the view that nuclear weapons are in and of themselves an existential threat, and therefore all of them need to go away, or you have to abandon pacifism. 
Uh, I don't take a stance on this, but I just wanted to kind of draw out some of the issues. And this leads me to conclude that nuclear ethics are of persisting importance within the field. Uh, it is why WMDs and ethics not only can be used in the same sentence, but should be. They permeate war fighting, targeting the use, and war waging the decisions and how those decisions are made. And it's used to form ethical heuristics around nuclear strategy. On just cause, what does that look like? Legitimate authority, who can use these weapons? Proportionality, can you have a limited nuclear war? And reasonable odds of success, and that is, if you use them, will they even work? Uh, you really have to confront the reality of WMDs. You can't pretend to live in a world where they don't exist, uh, and you cannot subject yourself to these continued challenges and give up, which is the fatalism I had at the end. Uh, the logic of deterrence is not true logic. It relies on luck, it relies on chance, and it relies on psychology. Nuclear weapons are themselves hyper objects. It's really hard to imagine a nuclear explosion. Uh, Oppenheimer kind of helped with this and move it along. But these are the, the amount of devastation wrought by it. Five billion deaths to famine is so hard to actually conceptualize as a person. And fatalism, which is that nukes exist, they're out there, they're not going away. Don't fall into that. Uh, there are There's active work that can be done on these issues. And even though I've pointed out some of the ethical concerns with nuclear abolition as a movement, um, it's not a point in which one should give up. And that's why we have these presentations. Um, a quick shout out to Charlotte for introducing me to the word hyperobjects. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Cameron. Really appreciate uh, your fantastic research and your great presentation. Um, we're going to turn it now to Clara Sherwood um, to talk about digital narratives, escalation, and crisis management. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Clara Sherwood. I'm a current graduate student at the Elliott School of International Affairs, and I'm also a Pathways intern with the U.S. Department of State. Um, and recently I returned from Hiroshima, Japan, where I was participating in the ICANN Academy. And so like Cameron, I will stress that all views today are my own and do not represent the U.S. Department of State. So throughout my time at FAS, my project has been focusing on digital narratives and conflicts. I've had an amazing research partner, with Jamie Wickman. And together we have focused on examining social media response, uh, particularly in regard to the Russia-Ukraine war. So this war has demonstrated that open and reliable communication between nuclear experts, government officials, and the public is imperative. And as Russia's nuclear saber rattling continues, it's important to understand that state governments are not the only actors contributing to nuclear narratives and conflict escalation. Non-governmental entities play a critical role in publicly managing nuclear escalation. Social media posts from individual experts, think tanks, and open source accounts are key for providing broad interpretations of the facts um, in a timely manner and now play a more pivotal role than before in managing nuclear escalation risks. And while there is existing research focused on how government officials can shape this uh, public nuclear narrative, there's little research on how non-governmental entities are likewise tailoring their message to the public. So in order to conduct our research, uh, we relied on a working paper by the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, which provides a chronology of Russia's public statements. Um, and they create three time periods of escalation throughout the conflict. So relying on this chronology, we compared non-governmental entities' digital responses to official government statements in the wake of these periods. We chose to use Twitter as our online ecosystem, and we analyzed 3,000 tweets from 30 non-governmental entity accounts, which we broke up into think tanks, individual experts, and open source investigators. And while Twitter metrics um, are important for understanding audience impact, they're limited in explaining how non-governmental entities respond to nuclear escalation. So we coded tweet content according to sentiment, classifying these responses as providing context, interpretation, or assessing implications. Uh, I have three examples for you. This first tweet is an example of an actor providing interpretation. Uh, some tweets took exact quotes from Putin and then interpreted them with their own feelings. Other tweets from actors provided context. Um, in particular, this tweet is providing basic nuclear facts and information as it pertains to Russia's nuclear weapons arsenal. And fewer accounts sought to deduce implications of the war and heighten nuclear escalation. Um, and perhaps the most salient example of a tweet explaining this lack of content is from Dr. Heather Williams, as she speaks about her own research on how social media can amplify narratives um, and create echo chambers. So based on our analysis, uh, it was clear that non-governmental entities provide both quick factual information and expert opinion to respond to conflict escalation. 
Non-governmental entities are contributing their own responses, policy recommendations, research, open source information, and commentaries into this digital ecosystem and global nuclear narrative. And while tweets may not directly cause international escalation, they do influence public audience engagement with their both fact and opinions offered in the wake of crises. And non-governmental entities play a key role in shaping digital engagement efforts by targeting their outreach to the public and could potentially have a mediating role in conflict given the trends that we're observing in social media data. So our research shows that government statements and policies can directly cause or dictate international conflict escalation, but non-governmental entities are best suited for providing broader public understanding and helping to shape public opinion through a social media response. Non-governmental entities are an important source of national security interpretations and are at the forefront of initiating open conversations about arms control, non-proliferation, and nuclear risk reduction with the public. And if indeed the future of conflict escalation is social media-based, non-governmental entities will be at the forefront. And some of the outcomes of my time with FAS, um, I published a piece on Instick about how Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter has compromised nuclear escalation and communication channels. Um, Jamie and I have an upcoming piece with the bulletin where we will be summarizing this work. Um, and additionally, on December 5th, I will be presenting this research at the CSIS 20 fall conference. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, and now we are going to turn to our next fellow, Charlotte Young, who is going to talk about nuclear narratives in the United States and Japan. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Charlotte. I'm one of the new voices on Nuclear Weapons Fellow, and I'm also a 2023 Midwest Youth Poet Laureate um, Ambassador. As a 2022 Hiroshima ICANN Academy attendee, I went to Hiroshima where I met with survivors of the nuclear bomb, so Hibakusha. I've also performed poetry around the world, including at the U.S. Ambassador's Residence in Dublin. I'm currently a junior at Purdue University majoring in political science, but I'm also a born scholar right now, so I'm actually in Japan, and I'm actually zooming in from Tokyo at 1 a.m. Uh, these views are also not representative of the Department of Defense. So my project, Culture Blast, the nuclear narratives told and believed today are rooted in how nuclear weapons are discussed in school, culture, and locality. My exhibits and art analyze how these are the roots through which come the multidimensional nature of how Americans and Japanese learn about nuclear weapons and how those define the systems that shape the public's views about nuclear weapons today. My research partner is uh, lovely Umayam, and my translator was Eliza Nicole. So for methods, we analyzed popular and common high school textbooks in America and Japan, specifically like uh, national history textbooks, and also nuclear related media and history um, and locality. So for example, we looked at how Japan and Japanese and Americans responded to Barbenheimer. I also interviewed nuclear activists in Japan. So for findings, the most interesting finding was this. American textbooks had very different information related to nuclear weapons compared to Japanese textbooks. Even the way the textbooks sounded were different. Case in point, these excerpts from American Pageant. When I first saw these, I thought these were crazy, but this is actually coming from one of the most popular AP American history textbooks in the US. Japan's fanatics forgot that whoever stabs a king must stab to kill. A wounded but still potent American giant pulled itself out of the mud of Pearl Harbor, grimly determined to avenge the bloody treachery. So as an artist, I thought this was so fun to read, but also like kind of a somewhat a researcher, I was really fascinated by this kind of like narrative that was being constructed, this kind of storytelling, because um, Japanese textbooks were very to the point in comparison, even after like looking at the translations, it was like they just listed a bunch of facts and really tried to like just be very to the point. Um, yeah, and it was really interesting, too, because even the textbooks mentioned in these textbooks were pretty different. So, for example, American textbooks only mentioned treaties like SALT and IBM, and mostly only in a U.S.-Soviet Union context, whereas Japanese textbooks discussed other treaties like the TPNW and the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And I mean, overall, as a narrative in Japan, the bomb achieves a sort of mythic status in artifacts and aesthetics, but in each iteration, it's a force of destruction with the only solutions being either death or reconciliation. Overall, Japan embraces and preserves a kind of predominantly anti-nuclear narrative, but there are nuances in the storyline. So for example, when I was interviewing people in Tokyo, I found that Tokyo actually kind of tries to avoid really making a really strong stance on nuclear weapons. 
Americans. And for several reasons, like being very strong allies of the US and being surrounded by nuclear possessing states, Japan as a country has become very invested in appearing politically neutral. So a lot of the nuclear disarmament movements we see globally are really driven by Hiroshima and Nagasaki rather than Tokyo or Japan as a whole. Um, it's a little bit difficult though to convey this kind of complexity through narrative, especially those that are really heavily influenced by national like narratives, like textbooks, for example. Um, surprisingly, the U.S. actually seems more uniform and straightforward. A majority of narrative threads in the U.S. portray nuclear weapons as a tool for justice of sorts, or really a way to spread their form of justice or American hegemony across the world. Yes, so for outcomes, the first one that we had was an exhibit at the Kurt Vonnegut Museum in Indianapolis, Indiana. So this uh, this exhibit had poetry that I wrote as well as art I wrote and also um, access to like an online exhibit where people could kind of learn about my preliminary research at that point regarding textbooks and education and kind of like all of the different nuclear narratives in both countries. I will. I also had an interview on this research on FAS's blog and also a video interview with the museum, though that hasn't come out yet. So Lovely and I are creating an online exhibit right now, and it will have like all of our research in all of the different areas we were looking at presented in a form that's really, I guess, visually appealing. In the future, we also want to create kind of a more open source aspect to this platform so that people around the world can send in entries describing how nuclear weapons entwine with popular culture or space in their localities. I also published an op-ed with um, Nigel Atomwappen, which is like a nuclear weapons like group in Norway. Um, and it was really about like artist activism and narratives and storytelling and how that kind of means how that can really influence uh, topics like nuclear weapons. And this op-ed was printed and distributed across the country. I will also be attending to MSP, so the second meeting of state parties this November as a Youth for TPNW delegate. Uh, so if any of you are there, let me know, we can meet up. <laughs> And in the future, I'm planning on publishing op-eds and or an academic paper on this work with Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, really appreciate it. I am still reeling from those uh, those excerpts from that textbook. I'm sure many, many folks are as well. Um, lots to digest there. But uh, we're going to turn over to our final fellow, Anna Pluff, to talk about scientific activism in nuclear policy. Uh, take it away, Anna. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Pluff, and it's a pleasure to be here today alongside this amazing cohort. I'm also an NGFP fellow at the National Nuclear Security Administration with defense programs. So similar to others, all views expressed here are my own and do not represent that of the Department of Energy. My background is in history, where I studied nuclear colonialism at UChicago, and I was previously at the Stimson Center researching domestic violent extremism and nuclear security. So my research alongside Dr. John Emery focused on the scientist movement for nuclear one-worldism. And nuclear one-worldism represented a theory of state building in which nuclear energy weapons would be under the control of a singular omnistate. And the Manhattan Project scientists who formed this movement, led by the Federation of Atomic Scientists, the precursor to the Federation of American Scientists, which we all know and love today, believed that scientists, engineers, and other technically trained thinkers have an ethical obligation to ensure that the fruits of their intellect and labor would be applied to the benefit of humanity through the creation of the atomic bomb. So in looking at the very beginnings of the nuclear age, this is a fascinating history because it was world government rather than deterrence that was seen as the best means for stopping future atomic wars, arms racing, and destruction. My research relied on archival data from the University of Chicago Special Collections, notably from Bulletin of Atomic Scientists articles and scientists' personal papers. And you'll see from the collection of names listed here is that the scientists who were involved in this movement were not just the high-ranking scientists, not just your Solars, Einsteins, or even Oppenheimer, but even lower ranking scientists from across the echelons of the Manhattan Project. There was this fervent belief in the need for scientists to enter the political fray and encourage statesmen to adopt ideas for world government. So what's really amazing about this case study is that for a brief period of time, it wasn't just scientists, but many intellectuals, diplomats, politicians, and thinkers thought seriously about the need for world government. Even President Harry Truman was initially consist of 
uh, convinced of its necessity and commissioned a Department of State to create a potential blueprint for what this would look like. And this was known as the Atkinson Lilienthal Report, which was released in January 1946. And this provided a detailed plan for a UN-like body that would regulate atomic energy and complete verification processes and inspections. Now, this plan ultimately faltered under the Barack plan, and happy to get into the politics behind that in the Q&A, but what I really want to focus on is this stunning role of scientists in their political activism in a way that was previously unprecedented in American politics. And what you had was politicians seeking out the advice of scientists in this sort of strange spectacle of the so-called lab lobby, dazzling policymakers. So besides publications like One World or None, scientists found different ways to promote world government. For example, Oak Ridge scientists led by John L. Balderston undertook the Letters on World Government campaign, which entailed writing to about 154 primarily American and British leaders in science, culture, and politics, and soliciting their opinions and advice about the establishment of world government. And they often ultimately set forth a series of recommendations of what this would look like in practice. And scientists also spoke at schools, rotary clubs, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, within the halls of Congress. What's interesting about this movement is it was ultimately an ephemeral movement, and this has to do with the coalescence of the Cold War state. And what I saw in my findings here were that increasing restrictions on political activities and rising paranoia began to really hinder the scientist movement. And most concerning is that policymakers began to see scientists' access to scientific ideas as dangerous, as they could be used in the national defense. So when scientists continued to advocate for things like civilian control, scientific internationalism, world government, they were accused of subversive activity that was damaging to U.S. security. Other issues played the movement. For example, scientists really struggled to reconcile this sort of newfound role as both scientists and politicians. And this was often used against them saying that, you know, scientists should stick to their ivory towers. They shouldn't be in politics. And you see as the national security state grows, instead of welcoming scientists into the fray, politicians start to turn against them. And scientists also struggle to utilize the mass communication systems that were available to them in the post-war period. So you saw many retreat to a sort of quiet diplomacy with organizations like FAS, like the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, wielding internal negotiations outside of the public eye and political sphere. This history provides potential roadmaps for how we might work to support scientists' ventures into policymaking and use their insights to rethink deterrence. So these are some of the pieces that I published alongside Dr. Emery, and please keep an eye out. We are working on uh, an upcoming journal article about this history as well. But to really focus on the sort of, you know, positive outcomes is that, you know, there are efforts today, like the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, that create a space in the national conversation for scientists to once again enter the ranks of policymaking. And the movement for world government should not be seen as a failed history. Similarly, deterrence cannot be seen as a successful history. And to predict that deterrence will succeed forever, you know, is also to engage in a sort of a historical thinking. And for me, the scientist movement offers us alternative pathways and a window into a new imagined future where scientific expertise can be leveraged once again to advocate for and ultimately create a safer world. Thank you. As folks can see from our fellows, really uh, phenomenal presentation, something that is really unique about this fellowship is that our four fellows each work directly with a senior academic or policy expert outside of FAS to co-author their research projects. And so I just want to extend, uh, take this opportunity to extend a, a really tremendous thank you to those four senior experts who were mentioned by our fellows, Alan Robach, John Emery, Lovely Umayam, and, and Jamie Withorn. Um, these four individuals provided really invaluable mentorship, detailed collaboration, and, and critique of the fellows' work, and uh, expertise with also pitching these projects to broader audiences and publications. So thank you all so much. Um, and thank you all to uh, to all of the fellows for such wonderful and thought-provoking presentations. Um, I wanna turn it over right now to our CEO, uh, Dan Correa, to say a few words about the fellowship and about FAS's broader global risks portfolio that we uh, are just launching now. And in the meantime, we will be 
monitoring uh, the chat for questions. So uh, please continue to add those as they come to mind and we will put them in the queue to ask our fellows uh, during the Q&A session. So Dan, uh, take it away. Thank you, uh, thank you, Matt. And, and thank you to the fellows um, for their incredible and thought provoking presentations. Um, I, I'm blown away. And I, I, I mean, th those were incredible. I'm, I'm left with um, two thoughts immediately. One, um, the fundamental interdisciplinarity of so much of this work and the power that comes through that, which I, I look forward to unpacking in the Q&A. And then, and then two, um, you all are incredible presenters. Like, where did you learn to do that? Um, I, I, I would love, I would love to personally take some notes uh, if you ever are interested in, in giving a clinic, because um, those were just really fantastic. Um, and I know I speak for us all when I say that um, we are excited about the work you've done through this fellowship, and we're eager to see where your careers progress and how you will contribute over the course of your careers to this field. I, as Matt said, I just wanted to say a few words here. Um, to contextualize a little bit. Um, I, I think it's first just worth noting um, where we are in terms of the state of global nuclear policy. Um, we're in a world in which nuclear armed states are modernizing their arsenals. Um, for the first time in 50 years, we have no arms control, active arms control agreements, limiting the deployment of US and Russian nuclear forces. Other countries, particularly China and North Korea, are growing their arsenals faster than we've ever seen. And nuclear transparency is going down across the board. Um, and this is all taking place at a time of, of rising geopolitical tensions. And I think that that's a very important moment within which to situate this effort that we've undertaken. Everything I just said, like a few generations ago, that might be sufficient pretext for a all hands on deck movement to bring the best and the brightest into this field, given the urgency and the stakes. And we at FAS believe that that, that is exactly what we need. We need new voices. We need new experts with multidisciplinary skills, whether they're technical, scientific, I mean, cultural, linguistic, and political, addressing the complexity of today's challenges new technologies and and, and 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 new realms of proliferation. And, and I think it's just important to say, if we just as a field approach this as business as usual, the community of experts um, won't be multi multidisciplinary, but, but also I think um, we'll look a lot in the future, demographically speaking, like it's looked in the past. Um, and so we're gonna miss out on lots of ideas and lots of expertise if we don't do something significant, right? The stakes are high, business as usual is not gonna cut it. So, you know, against that, that context and backdrop, that is why we started this fellowship. It is a modest effort, but we think it's a really important one. It draws on some, some work that we're doing in other contexts with our impact fellowship, which is focused on recruiting diverse expert uh, and emerging voices from all over the country to come and work on critical topics in government. And it, it it it's focused on bringing some of these voices into the fore and elevating them in ways that they otherwise would not and, and matching them with the expertise and analytical rigor of our nuclear information project. So through this fellowship, I think, you know, we've seen all of our fellows have made these significant contributions to the nuclear field uh, with fresh insights in how we understand nuclear history, ethics, nuclear pedagogy, uh, and emerging technologies in this context. So we are motivated by this. Um, this was an experiment. We took it on. I think the proof is in the pudding that this is both needed and that uh, there is talent to be found and elevated. Uh, so we want to carry it forward. And uh, we're, we're in the process of figuring out how we can replicate this pilot. Um, but we're committed to doing that. And I think we need help along that journey. So I just wanted to offer a couple of ways in which we would love this audience to help us. One, we are interested uh, in folks who want to raise their hand. We need new voices, as I said, um, at, at a moment like this. And in particular, I think 
we need new voices, even folks that don't have a background in nuclear policy, right? Two, I invite you to pull others in, both to tap people on the shoulder, get inspire them to, to become a part of this community, but also to, if you are an established voice in this community today, we need folks who are mentors. I think that goes for the formalism of this program, which Matt just described. But I think outside, just in a general community sense, I think that the the spirit of mentorship is how these communities grow and how we actually increase early career participation. I would just encourage folks to re reflect on their own journey in this community. Everybody I talked to who's in the nuclear field had some moment that inspired them, that was catalytic, that said, this is the calling for my professional career. How can you help others find that inspiration too? And then finally, we need help replicating this. Um, we're, we're looking for philanthropic, philanthropic partners to make this a sustainable and ongoing replicable activity and to grow it. So we'd love to talk to folks who are interested in, in financially supporting it. One other thread here is that we recognize the growing role of, of AI and the nexus of AI and nuclear. It is one reason why we have built, we, we've launched just this week formally, this, this global risks portfolio that contemplates nuclear as one of a handful of risks, risks that we, we are tackling um, and recognize together and recognize their important interaction. This fellowship is one piece of that broader portfolio and our efforts to meet that challenge. Um, and so we look forward to sharing more with the community on that and that overall framing and what it is we're going to be doing. As we move into q and I also just want to lastly thank the team here at FAS behind this work. Matt, Adam, Alex, Ellie, and others. Uh, this came about because you all saw that something like this should exist and didn't. Um, you proposed it, you pitched it, you ran it, you made it happen. It is better for that. Um, thank you for being the inspiration and the driving force behind it. I love the idea that this is how things bubble up and happen here at FAS and looking forward to where it goes. Okay, back to you and let's do the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dan. Really, really uh, appreciate that. So we're going to transition now into our Q&A. Um, I want to note that we're seeing a few questions coming in about fellowship logistics. Um, please, for those, keep an eye on our fellowships webpage on FAS.com for those, uh, sorry, at FAS.org, sorry, for those answers and announcements. We'd love to keep our questions here specific to the fellows research, but all of those details that you're looking for are up on our webpage. So um, we have a few questions coming in from the audience. Um, I'm going to start with uh, one for Cameron um, from a very proud former professor at ASU um, to has a has a really uh, phenomenal question about um, rational actors, right? Deterrence theory for so many years and decades has been built on this idea that that leaders are going to act in a rational way and in the way that we expect them to act. And so Paul is asking here, um, you know, how how. Uh, you know, when, when we think about the leaders that we have today in charge of our nuclear arsenals, um, can we sort of rely on that theory going forward and specifically the sort of Western centric view of rationality uh, that that we've sort of considered for so long in this field. So um, feel free to take a stab at that and uh, others feel free to continue putting questions in the Q&A. Um, and we're going to try as much as possible to keep your answers brief because we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to answer. Thanks so much. Um, first off, thank you very much, Dr. Carice, uh, for the question. Happy to see you here. Uh, the idea that deterrence theory is built on rational actors and that it's worked in that way um, is, unfortunately, for many who like deterrence theory, a false narrative. Uh, the plans, the war plans that we've been able to gather from Warsaw Pact members such as Poland uh, in terms of how the Soviets would pour into Europe, what the planning was that there were a conventional war in Europe, is that they would immediately use nuclear weapons to target the front lines and every major capital in Europe. Soviet records indicate that they intended to survive a nuclear war, that they were convinced that they could, and therefore they would be the winners of a nuclear war. And at the same time, they always thought that the United States was planning a first strike. So deterrence theory is held up because of some of the psychology, we managed to convince Khrushchev that nuclear war was not worth it and that they couldn't survive. Um, that is a positive example of deterrence winning uh, working out. But a, there's been a lot of accident. There's been a lot of chance. Uh, the idea that nuclear weapons are hyper objects, kind of hard to imagine, uh, actually playing out in a war contributes. Uh, but Western rationality, the idea that you know we can build these principles um, on base rationality, has never really worked out. 
Uh, and part of the benefit of nuclear ethics is that it is self-restraining behavior. And I know that that can be a bad word, but I think it's a positive uh, word, considering that we are a liberal democracy held accountable to our populace. They have a role in these strategies. We're seeing sort of ethics of war issues play out nowadays. Uh, and it is always beneficial both for uh, one's own spirit, one's own morality, and also for international standing to have ethical strategies. Even if it damages deterrence, uh, it's worth it. And it also doesn't take away from the fact that we still have the weapons. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Cameron. Um, we have two questions coming in for Anna that I think are related. So, um, uh, and they're both actually from members of our, our FAS team here, Hans and John, um, which is great. So, uh, Hans is asking, you know, the initial sort of concern from scientists within the Manhattan Project, um, or I guess the initial concern about nuclear weapons came from scientists within the project, right? Then that concern sort of spread outside, right? Thinking about movements like Pugwash and things like that. So when we sort of extrapolate that to today, do you notice any differences in how scientists view, uh, you know, nuclear weapons and nuclear risk reduction, whether or not they're sort of inside or outside the nuclear program. And then a great question from John, um, what is what is a story, right? You're a big history buff. What is a story that you found in, in the archives um, that really just wowed you? Uh, thank you both for those questions. And, you know, to answer Han's question first, I think one of the sort of interesting, you know, moments in history with the, you know, the beginnings of the Federation of Atomic Scientists and the move to the Federation of American Scientists was this recognition that, you know, Manhattan Project scientists realized that they needed voices to promote their cause from just outside of the nuclear field. But this sort of, um, this enlargement of the Federation actually was really wrought by internal schisms and the scientists actually weren't, you know, necessarily all on board to kind of open up their sort of activism and program. And I think that was a real sort of, um, a, a real sort of casualty, I think, in keeping momentum going for some of this activism at the time. Um, and I was really surprised when I kind of came across that history because I thought, well, wouldn't you want, you know, all these perspectives, all these voices promoting your cause? Um, and I think, you know, as, like I said earlier, the Cold War state sort of solidified you know, any moment of hesitation, I think, really started to impact that momentum. Um, so I, I'm glad that, you know, today we're, we're so much more united, I think, on a scientific front, but I think we still sometimes see, you know, nuclear scientists retreat a lot to the sidelines um, and not always thinking, you know, about how they can wield political activism in their work. And to John's question about um, you know, a fun, a fun archive find. This is, you know, always one of my favorite things to talk about. There was an incredible poem that I actually came across the University of Chicago Special Collections, written by scientist Samuel Schwartz. And to see, you know, it's always fun to see, you know, scientists engage in, you know, like literature and poetry. And he wrote this poem called The Adam Speaks. And in this poem, it really sort of demonstrated the moral burden and I think guilt that characterized, you know, a lot of the experiences of scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project and this sort of proximity to the destruction that they had created, I think brought about so much tension. I think for me, this helped me really understand why political activism was so important to these scientists, even though many of them were extremely uncomfortable in these roles. Um, it's an incredible document. It was never published, but um, it we John and I are, are actually utilized that poem in a different paper that looks at the religious imaginaries of Manhattan Project scientists. So always happy to follow up on anything um, related to that as well. But Fantastic question. Always happy to share, you know, cool archival finds. That's great. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, we have a question here for Clara um, from Evan Weaver. Um, so there's a there's a question here really thinking about, you know, how how Twitter is changing in particular, right? So we've certainly seen, you know, since Elon Musk has has come in, taken over, monetized this the sort of the blue check mark. Um, you know, we've seen that disinformation and uh, unverified accounts have really sort of skyrocketed. And, you know, we have sort of similar uh, situations going on in Instagram, right? Where there's, you know, there's a threads, you know, we've got blue sky now, there's Mastodon, right? All of these sort of different ways of uh, sort of distributing content and governments being able to distribute messaging is sort of now sort of decentralizing. So the question here is, how do you view this potential push to leave Twitter as well as the availability of all of these other platforms 
affecting nuclear discourse among non-governmental parties? Thank you for the question, Evan. Um, I've actually been thinking about this a lot and I do not have a good answer for you. Um, I will say that I think Twitter was a very unique platform specifically for the nuclear community. Um, as in the title, New Voices on Nuclear Weapons, I had a lot of catching up to do and being able to follow follow scholars and experts, people who have been in the field and hear what they had to say um, was so invaluable. And I think it's also been invaluable for um, the American public and the global public. Um, regarding threads, I'm not convinced given that it is owned by Facebook, which has its own um, notorious history of spreading disinformation and being unable to, to combat these uh, trends. Um, and personally, I would say regarding a push to leave Twitter, I would argue that um, nuclear scholars should stay on Twitter because if we retreat, then we're going to lose this established community on on this platform. Um, and I think that we should continue to pressure X to to become the Twitter that that we all used to to know because I don't think that Musk is. Um, I think that if he's pressured enough, perhaps there could be some changes, but I would urge people to stay on the platform and to, to continue fighting disinformation. That's great. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, we have a question here for Charlotte. Um, Mackenzie is asking, uh, you know, that she's very curious about your research and in your, co in your conversations with um, folks in Japan, whether or not you came across any current Japanese views on U.S. extended deterrence and how that sort of relates to, to the broader research that you were conducting. Yeah, I got really mixed responses, honestly, about deterrence in general when I was in Japan. Like some people I spoke with, they were very much just like not at all a fan of any nuclear weapons. And they referenced things like um, like the Lucky Dragon Boat incident where like a hydrogen bomb testing led to like one person dying on that ship. And then it kind of and also a lot of people getting radiation poisoning and then everyone like in the country just being extremely up in arms about the whole thing. Um, some people just outright just mentioned the bombings and then other people had like were more supportive because at the end of the day, North Korea is still launching these missiles. I had like, I think earlier this year or last year, they already like sent something over Sapporo. So there's already a lot of concerns about like being so close to nuclear possessing states. And in particular with Japan, it's a little bit complicated because they don't really have basements. Like structurally, it's just not possible in the country a lot of the time. So I think like only 10% of all buildings have basements. So if there is some like serious issue, they can't, they don't really have shelters. Um, so I got really mixed reviews, basically. Some people in Tokyo in particular were very much supportive of like US um, extended deterrence. And then other people, especially from Hiroshima and Nagasaki were very much against it. That's great, thank you very much. Um, okay, we have, we're coming up on time. So I'm gonna ask one last question. I'm gonna couple a few things together. And if you could keep your responses to maybe 45 seconds or so it's going to be a lightning round so we have a question from from john emery here and it's it's tied to another question that i can see what do you think is the role of art poetry and scientific activism um you know what what is the role today for raising public awareness about the existential risks from nuclear weapons climate change ai and pandemics and that sort of ties to another question that i can see here about um historically you know when folks were were sort of agitating for disarmament people were dismissed as peaceniks right so how do we um, sort of open up this conversation a little bit more to convince people about the consequences of nuclear war and open a, a more sustained doorway to disarmament. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, please keep your answers brief. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's like really important because when I talk to younger people, especially there's this belief that like, oh, nuclear issues are like really old and dusty or whatever. Um, and I think it's really important to especially explain to younger people um, how nuclear weapons like intersect with issues they care about, like climate issues, like Cameron discusses this quite a bit in his research. Um, like if you link that, I think that's really important just to illustrate the relevance of this issue. Um, I also think that scientific activism is really important because in Japan, in response to um, like the bombings, they just stopped working with the military completely. Like they swore off working with the military industrial complex for um, almost 80 years. And it wasn't until Shinzo Abe opened up a new fund in 2015 that they even started again. So I think it's really important that the key players, like not just civil society, but also scientists take a very firm stand on these issues.
Um, I'm going to draw on an ex on the experience I had with the Hiroshima Icon Academy um, with one of the presenters named Dr. Vince um, Itandi, and he said something very important that when discussing these issues, we should always try to meet people where they are. People come from these issues with their own perspectives. Maybe they're climate activists, so let's talk about those intersections. Maybe they are um, actors in the US trying to fight uh, for equal rights. Well, let's talk about how nuclear weapons has a history, um, is tied with racism. Let's try to find ways to always meet people with where they are. And I think that social media is, is a way to do that and continues to open up um, platforms for that. Matter really trying to get change to happen on these issues in whatever direction you want, um, it all comes down to policymakers. Uh, you can have activism, you can have pressure, you can have um, TPNW, but nothing changes if nuclear armed states, the policymakers within them, are unwilling to change their stances. Um, so it takes people who are willing to question deterrence, um, often referred to as a religion of deterrence, uh, getting into government, asking those questions. It takes identifying candidates for office, whether that be on the presidential or congressional level, who align with your own nuclear views um, to really make a change on those issues. And part of it is the insulation within the DOD in the United States. Targeting is not widely known or available. Uh, information on how we would use nuclear weapons is also not widely known or available to members of Congress or the president. Um, the president's not that deeply involved in these issues. And it's because it's meant to be this closed door psychological threat effectively um, to deter adversaries. And that doesn't work. Um, it's worked so far if we want to say so, but it doesn't work in terms of having an open democratic discussion about what these uh, policies are and what we want them to look like. So get after your policymakers. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, I think for me, my understanding of these issues comes so much from grappling with the individuals and groups who, you know, were closest to sort of the creation of nuclear weapons or on the front end of weapons development, like whether that being indigenous communities or rural communities. And I think activism so often derives from lived experiences. And similar to Clara's point, you know, policymakers need to be able to meet those communities where they are. And I think open themselves up to, you know, the different side of the nuclear weapons complex and understanding who our national security actually protects. And for me, I, I always wonder why policymakers so often fail to reach this understanding. And I think similar to Cameron's point is that it has to do with the way these thinkers are trained. It's so often in deterrence theory. theory, And you know they don't have that sort of connection and lived experience to the nuclear weapons complex. And I think meeting with those groups, having those exchanges, I think can better help policymakers, our government, um, people in the national security community better understand the risks, you know, beyond just, you know, Russia nuking us or, you know, whatnot. And I think that is such an important part in activism and what art and poetry and culture can help us understand as well, too. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for your, your great answers. Thank you to folks that submitted questions. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but if you do have any additional questions, either to the fellows or to, uh, to us about our fellowship, please feel free to reach out to us and we can um, try and facilitate uh, interactions. So as we close, I just want to offer a massive thank you um, to our to our four incredible fellows, to their research partners, uh, and as well as Dan mentioned to the FAS staff that made that program, uh, this program possible. So in particular, um, Ellie, Alex, uh, Adam, and our, our CEO, Dan. So please feel free to reach out to us with any questions um, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Thank you all so much for joining us.